so th thank you very much, Miaili. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a very uh, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I, will, I came here last year, actually. So this is my second time in Budapest. I came here for this uh, wonderful conference uh, of the uh, International Mineralogical Association that took place in the, in the, same, in the same buildings. Um, and so I'd like to say that it's really a great honor for me to, to be invited by the Erdvos Leorent uh, University and have the opportunity to visit your, your institute, your university, and also to, to give you some uh, ideas of what we are doing in Paris on, uh, on this uh, topic. So um, that's actually the, the very first time I think I, I give this talk on, on stromatolites and a, a, a nanoscale perspective so uh, please uh, feel free to stop me at any time if there is something that is not clear enough or so something that I, I, I don't explain enough. So please. Um, the first time actually um, I started thinking about working on stromatolites, it was several years ago and it was just after my PhD and I, I was looking for some project, some research project and of course the first thing I was thinking about, I was interested by geobiology, so I thought about stromatolites. Um, at the beginning, I just think it very fast. I thought, okay, that's not a good topic. <laughs> stromatolites, uh, I, I, I learned about stromatolites when I was uh, in school at the university, and it sounds like this is well known. I mean, stromatolites, people have been working on stromatolites for hundreds of years, so probably we know everything about it. Um, so I just left, just escaped from that topic. Um, then I, I realized um, that, okay, there are still, there are certainly big questions that are already answered, but there are a few things that we are still missing, I think, the, in the whole story of stromatolites. And so in, the, in this first slide, I'd like to introduce some of these questions that I personally ask, some other people ask, just to show you some of the points where I think the story that we have usually on stromatolite is not completely clear. So this, this is uh, one definition of stromatolites. You might find several ones in the literature. Stromatolites, you can define them as a pure geologist as structures, geological structures. There are uh, sedimentary deposits uh, that are, uh, they, they are usually composed of carbonates, but not only. We can find other minerals forming stromatolites. Uh, they show laminations, like on these ones, and uh, at a macroscopic scale. So these are macroscopic structures. Uh, they have a variety of morphologies. Okay, so that's a very rough general definition of stromatolites. We know modern stromatolites, like this one, that comes from the Bahamas. So this formed very recently, or this is currently forming. And we know very ancient stromatolites, like these ones, uh, that are uh, 2.7 billion years old. So these stromatolites, uh, we have found them for a long, long time in the geological record. So, as I told you, there are se several uh, uh, modern stromatolites, modern occurrences of stromatolites. You, on the left, you can see those from uh, the, the famous stromatolites from Australia in the Shark Bay. Um, this one from the Bahamas, and this one uh, from uh, Brazil, Brazil. And the thing is, when you look at these modern stromatolites, they are populated by microbes. There are many microbes microorganisms that inhabit those rocks. This is one uh, elect uh, sorry, light microscopy image. This is actually fluorescence microscopy where uh, we, we use uh, laser, just visible laser light uh, to illuminate or to excite the, fl the fluorescence of the pigments that compose the cells. So the, these different colors comes from the fact that you have different pigments composing these cells. 
These cells are cyanobacteria. They have pigments to perform photosynthesis, and that's why they show up in these pictures. So all these stromatolites are populated by microbes, and we think that these microbes take part into the formation of these modern stromatolites. So um, this is why, uh, sorry, this is why we thought uh, so that modern stromatolites are formed by microbes. And this is why we think that ancient stromatolites might have been formed by microbes. There are other hints or let's call them evidence of biogenic formation of stromatolites. In very old stromatolites, there were sometimes forms, objects that were observed and that were interpreted as um, microfossils, so remnants of former microbes. And these ones are probably the most famous uh, traces uh, in, these, in these rocks, those filaments that were evidenced by uh, Schopfen Packer, for example, in 1987. So these are carbonaceous filaments that are found in silicified stromatolites, and they were interpreted as um, fossils of bacteria. And basically, because of these, because of the analogy between modern and ancient stromatolites, we think that ancient stromatolites are among the oldest traces of life we know on Earth. Okay? The oldest stromatolites are 3.5 billion years old, so they might be the, among the oldest traces of life on Earth. Um, so, um, moreover, for in, in many papers in the literature, usually you can find some association between the idea of stromatolites and the idea of oxygenic photosynthesis or the idea of cyanobacteria. So when people think about stromatolites, they usually think about cyanobacteria. They usually think about oxygenic photosynthesis. Oxygenic photosynthesis is this reaction that somehow uh, help fixing CO2 from the atmosphere. This CO2 it, is transferred to organic carbon. And at the same time, you produce oxygen uh, to the, and that is released to the atmosphere. So this has, of course, very important implication for the geochemistry of the surface of the Earth. Because when you think about stromatolites, you think about production of O2, and then you think about oxygenation of the atmosphere. And why, why do we think about cyanobacteria when we think about stromatolites? Several um, arguments. First of all, the microfossils. Initially, the mi microfossils found, for example, or sh showed by uh, Schopf and Packer, initially they were interpreted as fossils of cyanobacteria because they look like cyanobacteria. This is no longer the case, but that was the initial thought. Second, there, there have been some biomarkers that have been found in 2.7 billion years old stromatolites from Australia. So basically, these were organic geochemists, uh, tr so isolating uh, the, the organic carbon from the rocks. They identified the molecules in this organic carbon, and they found some markers, some complex molecules, organic molecules, that were similar to the ones composing the cell wall of cyanobacteria. So this was one additional argument. And finally, the idea usually we have is this one. Why do we form carbonate stromatolites? Because we have cyanobacteria that can induce the precipitation of calcium carbonate using photosynthesis. Basically, the, we can write the precipitation of calcium carbonate this way. So we have calcium hydrogenocarbonate. And we, when we do this reaction, you see, we form calcium carbonate and we form CO2. Now, if you have a process like photosynthesis that fix, that trap this CO2, you see that we displace this reaction 
tower the right, so tower the formation of calcium carbonate. So that's the whole idea. We have cyanobacteria, they can perf perform photosynthesis, so they can fix CO2, so they can induce calcium carbonate precipitation. Okay, so that's major idea. Um, there are a few problems with this, all these ideas. First of all, so the idea was like, so this is a cyanobacterium. Let's pretend it's a cyanobacterium. Very, very uh, schematized, right? Very, very short. So there is an envelope. So the, you see the cell wall here, the, the yellow and the red, uh, and the, sorry, and the green represent the cell wall. So this is the cell wall. This microbe so import hydrogen or carbonate into the cell and transform it into CO2 which is fixed for the, for the photosynthesis. Rubisco is the name of the enzyme that fixes the CO2. When you do this, you release hydroxide. And this hydroxide can be exported outside the cells. And eventually, if you have hydroxide, so you raise the pH, if you have calcium or magnesium in the medium plus hydrogen or carbonate, you induce formation of carbonate and you induce the precipitation of calcium carbonate. So this is the model we have when cyanobacteria do photosynthesis, they induce precipitation of calcium carbonate on their envelope, outside of them, and eventually you see something. If you form the, the minerals around the cells, you eventually encapsulate the cells. You trap them in minerals, and so you fossilize them. So one of the, the ideas was that if we have cyanobacteria, they should get trapped in the carbonates, and they should be, get fossilized in the carbonate. And that's what we see on some samples. This is a, a sample that is from the mid Ordovician in China uh, by uh, uh, Riding uh, and, uh, and colleagues. So this is a, what they called uh, Giovanella, like they, they, they gave uh, the name of a fossil to these forms. You see all these filaments in the carbonates, they are interpreted as cyanobacteria that get trapped into carbonates that when fossilized by the carbonate through this kind of process. So then the idea might be to look for this kind of fossils in the whole geological record. And as long as there have been some cyanobacteria doing this, there should be some fossils showing that. The thing is, it's not the case. When you look at the geological record, first of all, the oldest calcified cyanobacteria, fossils of cyanobacteria that, that you can find in the geological record are, let's say, 700 million years old. These are the oldest one, 700 million years old. In the meantime, as I told you, the oldest stromatolites, they are 3.5 billion years old or 2.7 billion years old. We know that the atmosphere got oxygenated 2.3 billion years ago. And we have no trace of this fossilized cyanobacteria in such old samples. So you see, there are still mysterious things, something, things that we don't understand. Second problem, when we claim that the objects observed by Schopf and Packer, 1987, are microfossils of cyanobacteria, that was an evidence for the existence of cyanobacteria and the formation of stromatolites by cyanobacteria, the problem is, we know now this argument is no longer completely valid, at least on the morphological side, because there are some processes like this one. This was published by the team of Garcia Riz and colleagues in 2003. This was produced by purely abiotic processes. They just mixed some solutions under conditions that are, you know, geological relevant, ge geologically relevant, and they formed these things. These filaments with septations and so on, they look similar to these ones. So you can't rely only on the morphology to say that this is a fossil of microbe, this is a fossil of cyanobacteria. There can be a biotic processes doing the same thing. Second, some people say stromatolites means biology. Some people say you can form stromatolites through purely a biotic processes. So if you find a stromatolite, maybe it might have been formed through abiotic processes. 
then um, we associate stromatolites to cyanobacteria because in modern stromatolites usually when you go to modern stromatolites and you look at the bacteria populating the modern stromatolites you find cyanobacteria everywhere so we think okay cyanobacteria do, can do photosynthesis so they can trap co2 so they can induce calcium carbonate precipitation and they are everywhere so cyanobacteria have to form the stromatolites the problem is when you look at the modern stromatolites Metalites, you don't find only cyanobacteria, you find tons of other species and tons of other bacteria that can also induce the precipitation of calcium carbonate. These are an oxygenic photos photosynthesizer, so they can also perform photosynthesis, so fix CO2, but this time they don't form oxygen. And those ones can induce the precipitation of calcium carbonate as well. You have sulfate reducing bacteria, they can also trigger the precipitation of calcium carbonate and they populate modern stromatolites, and so on and so on. So the question eventually is who is really doing the calcification in cyanobacteria? So far, people have often said cyanobacteria, but actually it might be more complex. It is maybe possible that you form stromatolites without any cyanobacterium involved in. So, one question. So, we need to better describe the ancient stromatolites. That's the first thing. We need to go back to the ancient cyan uh, stromatolites. We need to look at them more carefully to understand whether the observation we have done so far were appropriate or not. And second, we need to better understand how modern stromatolites formed. And here are a few questions that, in my opinion, are, are completely open. First of all, what traces of microbial activity can we find in the stromatolites? If you have microorganisms doing something, can we find it in the minerals? Can we find this message stored in the minerals so that eventually we can find it in ancient stromatolites? Second thing, you have many, many different species populating modern stromatolites. Who is doing the calcification? Who is responsible for the formation of the stromatolites? And this is one related question. Are cyanobacteria necessary? If we remove the cyanobacteria, if we imagine a, a world where there is no cyanobacterium, can we imagine that we form stromatolites? This is a tough question. I don't have any answer, but at least we can ask the question. Um, then how does, do the microfossils form and under what conditions do they represent all the, bacterium, the bacteria that uh, inhabited the, the stromatolites? And finally, um, how can we be sure that when we, we, we compare the modern stromatolites with the ancient stromatolites, how can we be sure that both of them formed in the same way, that ancient and modern stromatolites formed in the same way? Okay, so I'll show you a few results that we have um, acquired over the last few years on ancient then on modern stromatolites. We started a few years ago working on, on ancient stromatolites. So that will be more a description of, of what we see on some ancient stromatolites and some of the questions uh, we asked uh, about these studies. So the samples were collected in Australia. They are 2.7 billion years old. And uh, so you see the, the samples were drilled, actually, in the, in the, the, the Archean terrains. And, um, this is a petrographic view of the sample, and this is a close-up. This is light microscopy showing how it looks like. Those carbonated level, those stromatolites, they are micro stromatolites. They, they show up as tiny domes of few microns that, are, that shows some lamination. You can already see that you have bright, bright uh, laminae and you have dark laminae. So we studied it more carefully using scanning electron microscope, light microscopy, Raman spectroscopy. And basically what we could see is that the dark laminae are composed of 
fer ferrous chlorides. So they are, let's say, clays with magnesium, iron, and manganese. So you see like these are reduced elements, um, and plus pyrite, silica, and other minerals, accessory minerals. So that's the dark laminae. The bright laminae, they are made of calcite, plus small amounts of aragonite that seems to survive to the, the aging. And there is some organic carbon everywhere, both in the bright laminae and in the dark laminae. So the first step we w went through is to have a closer look at the, down to the nanoscale. How do the organics look like, where it is exactly, and what is it composed of? So for this, we sliced in the sample, we sliced some thin section using uh, the focused ion beam milling, and I'm sure you are all familiar with this tool, that you, this nice tool you have here. Basically, this is a scanning electron microscope plus an ion gun. And with the ion gun, you can dig into the sample and, and excavate some samples from it. Uh, I, I've, I'll show you this very briefly. That's a movie that was um, uh, provided to me by, by uh, Hugues Leroux from, uh, from the University of Lille. And that's, they, sh they showed a movie of how they prepare cross-section that they use for TEM with the FIB. And so this is a, a completely, different, completely different samples, but basically, so this is SEM pictures. Okay, you magnify, you demagnify, and then you locate some sample that you want to prepare. The first step is that they will deposit platinum strap here on the sample, and then they dig into the sample, and then they thin the sample, and then they will cut here, here, and here. Okay, you see, it's now cut, and now they will approach the needle from the sample, and they glue the needle to the cross section with platinum here, and then they cut here. So now they can remove the cross section. Okay, they remove it, and they bring it to the sample order that is used for TEM. So they glue the sample, this glue the sample with platinum, they cut here, and now they thin down the sample. And now we have a cross section that is, that is 100 nanometer thin, and you can put it in the TEM. So we can use this sample for doing transmission microscopy. Okay, and that's the TEM view of the sample, and you can look down to the nanometer scale. So, first thing we do, we, we look at the, the sample by, t, by TEM, and we do just EDX mapping. So we, we get the, the maps of uh, major elements in the sample. And we look at the two, remember the bright laminae, calcite, and the dark laminae, chlorite, we first look at the carbonate laminae, the bright laminae, and this is how they look like. And in this laminae, we can see some globules, and these globules are made of carbon, so they are organic carbon globules, plus sulfur. There's a lot of sulfur in this carbon. This is not iron sulfur. There is no iron. I don't show you. Uh, this is the iron map. You see here, there's no iron showing up. So this is sulfur associated with the carbon. We have all the spectroscopy data that, that shows that really this is organic sulfur. So this organics that is within the carbonate laminae is sulfurized. There are some organic functional groups composed of sulfur. Now if we move a few microns away from the, 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 the calcite, the carbonate laminae, if you go a few microns away, it's here actually, the carbonate laminae. If we move here, this is the chloride laminate, uh, chloride lamination. Now if we map this chloride, we see carbon as well. It's here in red. But this time, there's no sulfur associated with this carbon. So we have carbon, organic carbon, in the, the carbonate laminate. We have organic carbon in the chloride laminate, but they, don't, they are not the same carbon. One con is rich in sulfur, the other one is, not is poor in sulfur. Um, and you see the, you have forms the globule morphology, and here there is no morphology. How can we explain that? We don't have the definitive answer for that, uh, unfortunately. But definitely we have two reservoirs of, of organic carbon in these 2.7 billion years old rocks. 
two possibilities. Either these carbons, initially, when the stromatolites formed, they were two different types of carbon, of organic carbon, and somehow we preserved these two different types of organic carbon with aging. So from the formation, we had initially two different types of carbon because we were in two different types of mineralogical laminae. A second possibility is that uh, we, so some of the carbon was easier to sulfurize than the other one. So sulfurization occurred after the formation of the stromatolites. The carbon that was within the carbonate was easy to sulfurize. The carbon that was in the chloride was not easy to sulfurize, and that would explain things. Anyhow, what we know is that sulfurization, this has been shown by organic geochemists, when you add sulfur species to the, to the organic carbon, you start protecting the organic carbon from further degradation. And so you might end up with better preservation of morphology. So the way we explain it is that at the time you formed the carbonates, there was some organic carbon here plus sulfur, sulfides, this sulfide interact with the organic carbon. There was no iron at the time you, we formed this laminate. There was no iron, so the sulfur, the sulfides interact with organic carbon, and so preserved the globule morphology of the organics. Of course, this is purely speculative, but these are one micron sized. One micron is the size of cells, of microbial cells. This is purely speculative, but you could imagine that these are some some kind of fossils of tiny mo uh, bacteria that got sulfurized, then entrapped into carbonates. Here, at the time you formed the chloride, there was a lot of iron II in the solution. So the iron II trapped the sulfides, and there was, no, there was no sulfur left for the organics. So the organics did not get sulfurized, and the organics then the morphology was completely destroyed and changed. Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief on that one. If we look at modern stromatolites, we find them in several places, like in lakes. If we look at modern stromatolites, we find bright, here is a light microscopy image, we find also bright laminae and dark laminae. The bright laminae here are aragonite, calcium carbonate. The la dark laminae are uh, some uh, silicates, smectite-like silicates. The funny thing is like, if we do the same, you cut FIB section, there's organic carbon everywhere here. If you do, if you cross-section these things, you can get this kind of cross-section that goes through here. In order to go a little further, we did, uh, we used, of course, transmission electron microscopy, but we used also this kind of microscope. This is a scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. This is very simple uh, microscopy. The light source is X-rays. X-rays produced by synchrotron. So basically, this is a huge facility, like several hundreds of nanometers wide. Uh, and, and so you use the X-rays produced by synchrotron. You focus the X-rays with a lens down to a spot that is 20 nanometer. And then you look through the sample. So this is why it is called transmission. The x-rays go through the sample. Now if you want to get an image, you have to, to scan the sample. So this is why it's called scanning transmission x-ray microscopy. This microscope gives you images with 20 nanometer spatial resolution. So that's better than light microscopy, not as, as good as transmission electron microscopy. But at the same time, you get also this spectra, and this spectra, you can get it for each pixel of this image. This measure the absorption of the X-rays in Y. It's the absorption of the X-rays by the, the sample versus the, en the energy. You can change the energy of the X-rays and measure the absorption for each energy. You get spectra. This spectra, they tell you something about the chemistry of carbon, for example. This is here for carbon. You see several peaks. Each peak relates to some type of, of carbon, like we can differentiate between aromatic carbon, carboxylic carbon, carbonate, and so on and so on. So yeah, you can do really chemistry. Okay, that's the explanation. Actually, you look at electronic transition between orbitals 
and you probe the energy of the orbitals in carbon, for example. So that tells you something about the chemistry of carbon. So now if we do that for the, this cross-section, we find three different types of carbon. This one, this is typical of carbonate. So that's fine. This is aragonite, so this is carbonate, nothing new. This one here is a bacterium. This spectrum looks completely different, as you see. So this is very rich into, uh, in aromatic carbon, plus there are some uh, aldehyde and carboxylic groups. This comes from a bacterium cell. And now if we look at the smectite layer, so imagine the chloride layer, there is a completely different type of carbon. You see, I mean, if you don't understand how you, this works, this spectra, you can see that the blue 